maybe we can start immediately the session. I'll uh, just uh, briefly introduce the, the speakers and the discussant. We'll have a one and a half hour uh, split in two papers, two excellent papers. Actually, the first paper will be on uh, safe asset scarcity and monetary policy transmission. Davide Tomio from Darden School of Economics of, of Business, University of Virginia, will be the presenter. And uh, the discussant will be Stefan Young from uh, Bundesbank. And the second paper will be instead presented by Ricardo Reis from uh, LSE uh, on the anatomy of a peg, lessons from China's parallel currencies. So, uh, and uh, Cosa Luis, I understand that Cosa Luis Pedro is uh, online instead and is from uh, Imperial College. So, a duel of the game, uh, 45 minutes each paper, 25 minutes presentation, 15 uh, discussion, five general discussion. So, I'll give you the floor immediately. Thanks, David. Thank you. Thank you, Carlo. All right. So while my slides get up, thank you so much for having me and thank you for including our paper in the program. We really appreciate it and we really look forward to all of y'all's comments and then of course the comments from our discussant, um, Stefan. Um, so this paper is co-authored with uh, Benoit and Miklos and luckily for me and for you, uh, they're here in the audience and they're the ECB and Banque de France respectively, uh, so the usual disclaimers apply. Now, what we're gonna be examining today is the following question. How does conventional monetary policy pass through to money markets when the assets you use as collateral on these markets are scarce? Now, let, give, let me give you uh, the context for the following question. Uh, the context is that following years of loose monetary policy, both conventional and unconventional, the ECB decided to raise interest rate in July 2022. And they decided to raise the interest rate uh, without, or while still holding large balance sheet, while still holding on to a large quantity uh, of sovereign bonds. Uh, that is, they decided to engage in raising interest rate before engaging in quantitative tightening. What we're going to ask about today is what is the consequences of this timing, again, raising rates before selling assets, on the pass-through of conventional monetary policy to the money markets. Um, the reason we're going to do this is because uh, it has been established, both by uh, some of the people in this room, uh, that the asset scarcity that follow QE really impair the functioning of repo markets. Therefore, the question that we're going to ask today is the following. Does the safe asset scarcity following QE impede the pass-through of conventional and monetary policy to money markets? Let me give you an idea of what we're talking about. So here I show the consequences of the increase, uh, the rate hike, the increase in the DFR in July 2022. So here to the left, you have the increase in DFR, the 50 basis point. The next column is increase uh, in Esther, uh, which is an uncollateralized interbank rate uh, between the week before and the week after the rate hike. Now you'll see that that increase in Esther is 49 basis point, is essentially there, it's almost the same as the DFR. The next three columns here tell you how uh, collateralized rate, rates collateralized by euro-wide Italian and German collateral bonds, uh, German bonds as collateral, how they increase surrounding the rate hike, again, week before to week after. You see, they're significantly below this 50 basis point increase in DFR. What we're gonna show you is that uh, how far they are from that increase in DFR is actually gonna be a function of how scarce these assets are. I'm gonna also show you that this increase in scarcity that follows from this uh, poor pass-through uh, had an impact on the changes in the yields of the bond. The idea here is that bonds that were more scarce, uh, they saw a worse pass-through, which means their specialist increases, as the special increases, their price uh, increase or don't decrease as much, which means their yield increased but did not increase as much as those yield of bonds which are not as scarce, all right? Um, for the rest of the presentation, I'm gonna focus on the July uh, 2022 rate hike. I'm gonna show you the results also hold for all of the 2022 rate hikes. Uh, and then if I have time after my conclusion, I'll tell you a little bit about what happens if you extend the analysis all the way to the latest rate hike from last month. Now, we were not the first people to think about what's gonna to happen to the transmission uh, to money markets of a rate hike uh, while these assets are scarce. Here's a few uh, quotes from, for example, Bloomberg. Bloomberg mentions how lagging repo rates risks undermining the ECB latest tightening push. 
Uh, Financial Times speaks about how the Eurozone repo money markets have become dysfunctional and threaten the ability of the uh, central bank to push monetary policies. Centralbanking.com makes the connection we also make about the, the, uh, the, between scarcity and the pass-through, saying that a lack of high-quality collateral in the Eurozone resulted in the money market rates lagging the ECB policy rates, therefore preventing an adequate, adequate policy transmission as policy rate rises. Most importantly, here's an extract from uh, a speech by Isabel Shamble. Uh, Isabel said the euro system outright holding of the euro area sovereign bonds currently amount to more than a third of the standing uh, market, this idea of scarcity. As a result, the scarcity premium the market's participants must pay to obtain these assets have been considerable, both in the repo and the bond market. Uh, such asset scarcity can delay or even impair the transmission of monetary policy and implies that sovereign yields in the euro area, largest economy, remain more accommodative than intended in our policy stance. And that's exactly what we're going to show to you today. So I'm going to show you our results uh, in four points, in four graphs, because I find that easier. Um, and so um, the first result we're going to show you is that surrounding the rate hike of July 2022, uh, bonds that were more special, they saw the repo transaction of transactions that were collateralized by these special bonds increase by less compared to the same increase in repo rate uh, collateralized by bonds that were less special. And so here you have on the x-axis how special uh, the bonds were uh, prior to the rate hike. And on the x, uh, uh, that's on the x-axis, on the y-axis, uh, the change in repo rate the week before to the week after uh, the rate hike. And you see that there's a very negative relationship uh, clearly represented in the data. The second point, I'm going to take this lack of pass-through and I'm going to link it to the value of the bonds, the prices of the bonds. So here you have uh, the specialness of bonds prior to the rate hike on the x-axis. On the y-axis, you have the increase in uh, net asset swaps. So what this means is that bonds were more specials uh, uh, before the rate hike. Uh, they experienced an increase in net asset swaps. Uh, they were smaller compared to bonds that were less special. That means that these bonds, uh, the prices for the bonds decrease by less, prices of very special bonds decrease by less, which means that their yields increase by less. Compared to bonds which are not special, uh, they saw a um, larger increase in yield surrounding the rate hike. Finally, I'm going to uh, connect um, the, um, the, how much the central bank's QE efforts had made this asset scarce. So here you have on the x-axis the fraction of bonds rescaled that was held by the central bank as of December 2021. Uh, and on the y-axis you have the pass-through, again, to money market rates surrounding the July 2022 rate hike, and you see a clear negative relationship. All right. So I am linking the scarcity that follows QE uh, to the pass-through, to the yield of these bonds, just uh, aligned with really uh, Isabel Schnabel's uh, interpretation or narrative. Finally, I'm going to show you that uh, as um, there is a heterogeneity in the way that this, this uh, um, uh, repo rates changes, this heterogeneity is actually uh, is going to be reflected in the heterogeneity in the changes of funding cost of market participant. So what we show here is we calculate what, how would the funding rate, the funding cost of banks, if they were to lend out their bonds, change from before the rate hike to right after the rate hike. And we we'll plot the distribution here. If all of their funding costs in the collateralized market uh, change by exactly 50 basis point, all the mass will be around zero. Whereas we show that there is a ladder, large heterogeneity. So you have some banks for which uh, the banks here near the zero, for which when the deposit facility rate increases by 50 basis point, their collateralized cost also increases by 50 basis point. Whereas there are other banks down here, that mass there, for which when the DFR increases by 50 basis point, their collateralized rate only increases by 30 basis point. And so um, we're going to make an argument that this might have indeed an impact on the real economy. All right. So before I show you the analysis in detail, uh, let me give you a little bit of a summary of what we find. So the first question we ask is, does safe asset scarcity reduce the pass-through of rate hikes to money market rates? And we show that yes, indeed, pass-through to money market rates is impeded in a way that is inversely proportional to uh, specialness or scarcity. Um, the second we're gonna, uh, uh, question we're going to ask is, does the QE efforts of the central bank have any bearing of this lack of password? I'm going to show, yes, that's the case. Repo for bonds that were purchased more during QE, they show less than password. 
we're going to uh, make an argument that the, the mechanism behind this is really who holds this bond and whether they participate and they, they, um, they, they pledge this bond on the repo market. Finally, I'm going to tell you about the connection between uh, this pass-through, the impaired transmission of money market rates, the relation between this impaired transmission and bond prices, and I'm going to tell you how different investors are heterogeneously uh, impacted. All right? So that's um, broadly what we're going to show today. So uh, before we get into the details, I want to make sure that we're all speaking the same language. Here by specialists, I mean the difference between the deposit facility rate and the repo rate at which a bond trades on the repo market. And what I want to show you is just how prevalent the specialist scarcity was on the repo market. Here you see the average special repo rate for the average Italian and German government bonds. And what you see here is that during uh, right around the, um, the first rate hike in, in July 2022, uh, this is when specialists really was at its highest in all the sample that we consider. It was as high as 20 basis points for the average Italian bond and um, more than 40 basis points for the average German bond. And this is not driven by a few outliers. This is the fraction of bonds that were trading 10 basis points uh, below DFR or more, uh, the fraction of bonds issued by Italy and Germany. And at the time of the July rate hike, more than, 90, more than 80% uh, of both Italian and German bonds are actually trading on special. So this was uh, a quite a, a, a spread, a, well, a, a wide uh, problem in the bond market. All right. So why do we uh, think of uh, repo markets when we want to talk about monetary policy transmission? Well, uh, it is the largest segment of the money market. So transaction in collateralized, um, uh, collateralized transaction uh, really dwarf um, uh, the amount of volume in, uh, in the unsecured um, uh, kind of segment of the money market. We're going to focus on special transaction, which now make up more than two-thirds of all repo transactions, the other third being uh, GC transactions. And of course, these rates have an impact on the prices and the yield of these bonds. And so we really do think that uh, the password to money market has an impact on uh, potentially on monetary policy transmission. All right. So this is what I'm going to tell you today. Data empirical setup. I'm going to show the results talk a little bit about the channels that we have in mind, uh, tell you about the broad pass-through, the, the funding cost, heterogeneity consequences of this, and then conclude, and then hopefully I'll have a few minutes because what I want to do is we actually managed to extend all of our analysis to cover all the way until 2023, and so I at least want to show you what happened in 2023 considering all 10 rate hikes since July 22. So, uh, quickly on the data, we use uh, regulatory data from the ECB, money market statistical reporting that tells us uh, fully identified repo transaction data, uh, throw in some broker tech and MTS uh, information to figure out bond prices. Uh, we use uh, holding data statistics to see exactly what is the portfolio held by the ECB, uh, what is the portfolio held by bank groups, and what is the portfolio held by other investors at the investor country level. Uh, in terms of the transaction we consider, we look at we consider we look at one day uh, maturity repos, which are spot next, which is by far the most uh, traded tenor. And we're only considering repo which are collateralized by bonds issued by treasury bonds issued by Germany, France, Italy, and Spain. We define specialness as I mentioned, uh, and when we talk about password, we think of the difference between uh, repo rates five days before to five days after um, the rate hike. And when I think uh, when I say um, Pre-hike specialness, again, I mean the average uh, um, specialness in the five business days before the rate hike. With that out of the way, let me give you a little bit of a, at least an unconditional um, uh, sort of picture of what happens to specialness around the rate hike. So here you see the average specialness before and after the rate hike, the average repo rate before and after rate hike, and therefore the pass-through. So the average bond was trading 68 business point, minus 68 basis point repo rate, after the rate hike, it was minus 24 uh, basis point for a pass-through of 43 basis point, significantly lower than the 50 basis point that was in place in the DFR. And this is how it changes by country. And really what we want to focus about is uh, pointing out and, fee and, uh, and um, demonstrating how that difference is going to be a function of scarcity and a function of specialness. So this result of the, the lack of pass-through, that, that was a, uh, uh, impeded pass-through surrounding a rate hike, it's not just true for the first July 22 rate hike, but when we, we put all of the 250 changes, uh, business point change in the FR, uh, the results still hold. Still, again, the idea that uh, the, the pass-through to the money market rates, repo rates, was not perfect, even if we take all of the rate hikes of 2022. All right, so what I'm gonna show you now is the relationship between the pass-through to the money market uh, and uh, the specialness of this bond. Um, so, 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, look at the pass-through for bond I and regress that on the specialness before the rate hike uh, for a set of the bonds I mentioned earlier. You have the just scatter uh, plot relationship to the bottom left here and the regression relationship to the bottom right. And you see that there is a very clearly negative, statistically significant relationship between pre-hike specialness and the pass-through. Again, there is, um, uh, all, the password is generally below 50 basis points, so it was impeded, and it was impeded along a very specific dimension. Bonds that were more special, they experienced a much worse pass-through compared to bonds that were less special. So that's our first result. And it just, again, as I mentioned earlier, it just doesn't hold for the July rate hike. It holds uh, the same result, which is that there was a positive change in specialness based on how special a bond was before the rate hike. It holds for all of the rate hikes of 2022. So if you believe what I just told you, that the pass-through uh, was negatively correlated with specialness, and if you have read uh, Imens, Benoit's, and Miklos's uh, paper, or my paper on the topic, or actually Stefan's paper on the topic for that matter, uh, you will know that uh, specialness in the repo market really was uh, increased as a, as a consequence of the scarcity created by the purchases by the central bank during QE. And so it would, uh, it would be reasonable to link the pass-through that we observe, not only to specialness, but really to how much each single of these bonds had been bought by the central bank during its QE efforts. And so this really creates, in my, uh, in my head, uh, a nice tension in this regression between conventional monetary policy and unconventional monetary policy effectiveness. So uh, the regression I'm going to run is the following in reduced form. We're going to uh, run, uh, we're going to uh, regress the pass-through um, uh, around the July 2022 rate hike on how much the fraction of the bond, how much a bond had been bought by the central bank during QE. Meaning we're going to look at a change in rate, okay, in, to, in July 2022. We're going to regress it on how much the bond was, had been held by the central bank as of December of the previous year. And we're going to show that that's negatively uh, related and significantly related. We can think about it as a reduced form regression or more of an instrument regression, meaning the idea of the causality here going from um, the share held as central bank to specialists and then from specialists to the pass-through. And so this is what I show in, in, in this regression here, that there is a significant, statistically significant negative relationship between just how scarce a bond had been made by the central bank during QE and how and the change in repo rates for, for transaction collateralized by that bond around the July 2022 rate hike. All right, and this is just in, in graphical forms. Now, um, if you buy all of that, what I had to say so far, you might ask the following, but does this lack of pass-through to the repo market actually translate to a sluggish pass-through to the yield of this bond uh, to the cash market? And I'm going to show you indeed that that is the case. And I also think, okay, what could a central bank do to improve the pass-through? Uh, and we're going to have a couple of words on this in our conclusions. So, um, to understand how this lack of pass-through um, impacted bond yields, we do the following. We regress the change in bond yields surround so the July 2022 rate hike on how special a bond was before the rate hike, and we find that that is very significant. To give an idea of the magnitude, for every 10 basis point of specialness of a bond prior to the rate hike, uh, yields increase by two basis point less. So this is quite significant. Um, of course, you might say there is a million other things that affect in that, how uh, yields changing on a rate hike, uh, and we agree. So uh, to this regression, we add uh, duration and convexity of the bond and show the special is still very significant in terms of yields. Uh, you know, there could be you know, credit risk component going on, and so we include counterfix effect, we include maturity fixed effect, we, could, we include maturity by counterfix effect. We really try to absorb all possible variation that is not coming from how scarce and how, uh, how scarce a bond is and how uh, valuable it is as collateral, and we still find uh, that uh, there is a very uh, clear relationship between specialness before the rate hike and the change in yields. The idea, uh, the, 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 the channel here of the Oh, the chain of arguments here is the following. A bond that has a larger specialness before the rate hike, it will experience a smaller or worse pass-through, which means that their specialness will increase, which means that there's more special dividend connected to this bond, uh, which means that this bond will command a higher price or lower yields. Or alternatively, that this bond's yield will increase by less uh, around a rate hike. Now, you might still not be happy with our regressions here because we're not controlling for everything pro the proper way. And so what we do is the following. We calculate uh, asset swap spreads for each bond. So uh, 
this really measure how much of the value of the bond comes from its value as collateral, not from its exposure to interest rate, not from its exposure to credit risk. Uh, and we show this, uh, this, this um, uh, we then subtract the proper tenor CDS from this asset swap, yada, 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 um, to really get to the point about how much of this asset, how much of the value of this asset comes from uh, its value as collateral. And we show here the relationship for the average German bond between uh, asset swap spread, net of CDS, the red dots, and the blue dot that is specialness. So these two measures really go hand in hand, right? So the specialness uh, on the repo market and the, and, and the pricing on the, on the cash market are tightly related. Uh, and so our results will then appear evident now. That uh, is the bottom right graph here. So what this graph tells me is that bonds that were more special uh, before the rate hike, these bonds experience a much smaller change in net asset swap, which means again uh, that their prices decrease by less, which means that their bond yields go up by less uh, during, uh, uh, around the rate hikes, which really sort of, um, in my idea, uh, in my head, uh, establishes the relationship between uh, the uh, QE-driven scarcity specialness to the lack of pass through then an effect on uh, yields, uh, just the way that, uh, um, that I mentioned from Isabel's speech later, earlier. So what is driving this result? Um, in our head, what is driving the result is a heterogeneity in who's holding these bonds. Meaning, what we think is that bonds are on special, they're more special, they tend to be held by investors that are less likely to take advantage of the increased uh, specialness. What do I mean? When there's a rate hike, this rate hike creates a profit opportunity for somebody who holds a bond that is very special. The profit opportunity is the following. You just land it on the river market, take the cash, and then park it at the DFR, or at some higher rates. The more of this arbitrage you do, the better the pass-through should be. And so what we suspect, well, suspected and then verified empirically, is that bonds that experience a very poor pass-through, these are bonds that are not held by financially sophisticated investors that take advantage of, of these arbitrage opportunities. And that's exactly what we show here. So here we have on the y-axis, again, the pass-through surrounding the July 22 rate hike. And on the x-axis, we have how much of this bond was held prior to the rate hike by financially sophisticated institutions, such as banks, insurance co uh, corporations, and pensions. And here we show, indeed, that the more a bond was held by this financially sophisticated investor, the better the pass-through this bond experienced who's on the other side of the scale in terms of sophistication, perhaps foreign investor who are not as active on the repo market. Or maybe another investor that doesn't necessarily lend its, its asset very actively, uh, such as the central bank. So the results earlier regarding the central bank purchases is quite consistent uh, with, the, with this uh, narrative that we have in our head. You might think that uh, this uh, results might be driven by, for example, uh, uh, difference, uh, for example, um, uh, bargaining power, different, uh, differential bargaining power between uh, cash lender and cash borrowers. Uh, these are uh, in the paper. We actually um, uh, ruled this out, although it, it, it does explain some part of the variation of what we observe. All right, so now in the three minutes I have left, I want to tell you about the pass through, the, the differential pass through uh, across different investors and just how long it took for this pass through to eventually be perfect. And the answer is very long. First thing I want to show you again is we have this, we run this kind of thought experiment. If we were to look at the portfolios of all banks in the Eurozone, and we were to look at if they were to lend their bonds the week before and the week after the rate hike, and we look at the difference how much the, how, uh, how, uh, about the rate they could have funded themselves at, how much does this rate change around the rate hike? If they change it by 50 basis point, which is the change in DFR, you should see all of the mass around zero, and we show that that is not the case. Indeed, there is a significant difference between, say, uh, this guy here, this bank for which their funding cost increased by essentially 50 business points per 50 business point increase the DFR and it happens to be because they hold not very special bonds there's a large difference between what happens for, to that bank and what happened to a bank down here uh, for which the funding cost when the DFR goes up by 50 business point only increased by say 30 business point because they happen to be holding very special bonds 
Now, for this to in any way have any bearing on the real economy, we should expect this not to be a flash in the pan sort of event. You see a scarcity, you see specialness, and then that goes away uh, you know, f eight days after the rate hike. Uh, so here we calculate the pass-through uh, as time goes by, still using five days windows, but then moving the windows further and further away uh, from the rate hike. And what we show here is that uh, this increased specialness of this lack of pass-through does not resolve in any time soon. It takes um, you know, more than 40 days. Essentially, by the time the next rate hike happens, uh, this, the first one hasn't kind of lived, hasn't, hasn't or the, the increased scarcity of the first one hasn't d disappeared yet. Last thing I want to tell you about our conclusions and then show you what happens in 2023 mm -hmm. with the one minute I have left. Um, so I'm going to conclude. I'm going to um, just summarize what I told you, which is that this rate hikes were uh, less than passed through to short-term rates. And the reason that is, is because uh, of how scarce these assets were, and that has a consequences on the prices of this bond. What can the central bank do to ameliorate the situation? Well, it can re reduce its balance sheet, which is exactly what I'm gonna show you in a second is what happened in 2023, uh, or it can uh, increase the availability of assets on the secure lending facility, uh, which also happened. So, I wanna show you in the 30 seconds I have left, what happens if you move away from the 2022 world into 2023. Um, so first of all, the relationship between uh, specialness before a hike and average pass-through um, around this rate hike, if anything, becomes a lot more statistically um, strong when you consider all of the 10 rate hikes. Another, what I think is a super cool result, is what makes me excited, is this discontinuity you see around 20 basis points. We actually found this discontinuity using this uh, kind of uh, endogenous threshold regressions that essentially select where you should split the sample uh, to have the best explanatory power. And what we show is it really happens at 20 basis points. Why? Because at 20 basis point, that's when it makes sense for you as an investor to go to the central bank and to borrow the bond from the central bank using cash. It's where there is this extra supply coming from the cash collateralized secure lending facility by the ECB. As um, um, scarcity decreased in 2023, um, what well, we showed that scarcity did decrease in, in 2023, and as scarcity decreased, uh, of course, you should expect password to improve in 2023, and that's really what we show. So here we show the password for the different rate hikes. This is really what we, should, we focus on in our paper at, in the current version at least, uh, and this is what happens after um, December 2023. 2022 for the rate hikes in 2023. All right, so why is that? And it goes back to Philip's uh, slides. Here we sh it is essentially there is an increase uh, in supply coming from both an increase in uh, issuances by the government uh, and uh, decrease in the euro system overall balance sheet, therefore reducing scarcity entirely in line with our story. Okay, thanks a lot. And now we are ready for the anatomy of a pack. Okay, Ricardo. thank you. Okay. Let's see if that works. Oh, they're not quite ready for me. Anyway, thank you for having me. Um, and there we go. Um, about 14 years ago, um, China undertook or China implemented a very large scale monetary experiment. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about over the next uh, 25 minutes. That experiment is interesting because China is now uh, on the road to be the largest uh, economy in the world. But it's also interesting because it's going to allow me to reevaluate some very fundamental principles of monetary economics, namely the role of money in exchange rates. What was that experiment? Or let me start with the motivation for that experiment. In 2009, China, having grown as a very large player in international trade markets, still had a currency, the yuan, that was entirely domestic. In 2009, the PBOC said we want to internationalize the yuan. It wanted to internationalize the yuan, much like, by the way, in 1913, the Federal Reserve is founded with a goal of having the US dollar used outside of the US, which it was not in 1914. But the PBOC had a particular constraint in doing this, in that it wanted to have both a free current account for after all, this country is the largest trader in the world with millions of transactions every day across different goods, different people, different destinations, different firms, while at the same time having a closed capital account, 
whereby I can just go and buy some asset in China freely or invest in some factory there, nor can a Chinese citizen just decide to buy some asset here in Frankfurt, but rather, for the most part, the state is the one who decides where those investments are. How can you achieve a free current account with a closed capital account in terms of freedom? The answer of the Chinese authorities of the PBOC was to do a large-scale monetary experiment, which was to create a parallel currency. Parallel currency had existed before, it was not an original idea, but at this scale and with its features, it was a quite remarkable experiment. Namely, if you are a Chinese citizen, I don't think I, maybe there's some in the audience, who lives in Beijing right now, or in Shenzhen, let's say, and you make a payment with your card, the currency you're using is the so-called CNY. That currency works less, just like any standard currency with a money market, whereby there's reserves of banks at the central bank in CNY, there's a clearing mechanism, real gross time settlement happens, and that is the currency that as a Chinese you think about. In 2009, what was created, or it already existed, some structure, but really started, was the a parallel currency called the CNH. Big chunk of it in Hong Kong, but some also in Singapore, in London, and in other places. CNH is a currency that if you're making a payment, again, with a debit card on a Hong Kong bank, that is the currency that you have, even though both of them are called the yuan, or in their banknote form, the renminbi. Where in CNH, there is absolutely no limits in using it. I can right now go to a bank in London, open a CNH account, Again, a yuan account is going to be a CNH account, and I can pay not just for Chinese goods, but also you or you or you. I can pay anyone in CNH. It is a free account, and that is the account that is being used for payments to buy goods that are invoiced in renminbi out of China or not. Okay? CNH is a completely free currency in many ways. CNY, though, can only be used by Chinese to a first approximation, meaning if you want to invest in a domestic ass in asset, say, in Shenzhen, then you need to have CNY. And me, as a non-Chinese citizen, cannot easily get CNY in order to do that. That is, the capital account is closed because to get into, to either invest into in China, I need to use my CNH to get CNY. Not easy. And for a Chinese citizen who has CNY and wants to invest abroad, he needs to get his hands into CNH. Not easy. Why not easy? Because converting CNH and CNY is where the controls really bite. Um, there are controls on foreign direct investment. There are very heavy controls on my ability to stuff my pockets with banknotes, take the subway from Shenzhen to Hong Kong, and deposit in the bank there. But more importantly, there are very strict quotas, very strict controls, in that a Chinese firm that sells a good to me whom I pay then CNH, can only exchange that CNH for CNY to pay its bills in China, to pay its workers, against showing the invoice that it made that sale to me. That means that, for instance, large exporting firms in China all have a money market desk, a treasury desk, like we used to have in banks, but they have it in exporting firms, who all they do is have a stack of invoices and try to essentially arbitrage within CNH and CNY and move as you wish to do so. Likewise, banks, Chinese banks that have operations in Hong Kong, say, and in Shenzhen, will have a limited ability to shift their deposit and reserves between the two, imposed by the PBOC in terms of being able to control these flows of capital. And so what you have is you have these two parallel currencies, and this very, not original, but quite striking idea of, let me try to impose capital controls by going to the root of how capital flows, which is through the payment system, through currency. At some point, you have to convert CNH to CNY in order to move your capital in or out of the country. And so this is how you can achieve an enormous economy of a scale never seen is able to impose a capital control of some form. So far, so good. This is how the Chinese impose capital controls. Problem. Classic monetary problem. If you have parallel currencies, Gresham's law is going to come to bite. Meaning, if I'm a Chinese citizen, and, you're, and Carlo here is a Chinese citizen too, and we live in Shenzhen and have an account open in Hong Kong, say an account open in Shenzhen, we have a debit card in CNY, we have a debit card in CNY, we can pay each other in one or the other. 
and therefore bad money will drive good money out. In other words, the exchange between these two forms of currency has to be more or less one. It can deviate from one. The whole point of the capital controls is that it can deviate from one. I can't just simply use one versus the other because I have limits in exchanging one for the other. But if it deviates too much, the capital controls would fall apart because I would come up with some ingenious way to stuff my pocket and be able to pay in one of the currents rather than the others, as 300 years of monetary history teaches at least. The PBOC has been extremely successful in that the exchange rate between CNH and CNY has deviated from parity by 20 basis points, rarely more than 10 basis points in the last five years. Therefore, we have here one of the most successful pegs in the history of certainly parallel currencies or foreign currencies, and this paper is going to try to make sense of that peg or use this experiment to try and understand some principles of monetary economics. How does the PBOC do this? It does so by controlling the stock of money in CNH. Now, the way it does it, if you go and try to read the very, very little literature on this, sounds very confusing, very complicated, lots of funny different institutions going on. But let me argue to you that actually it's fairly conventional. Let me start by reviewing, to this audience probably unnecessary, the conventional way in which we think about monetary policy operations. If you want to expand the money supply, the central bank increases reserves by buying government bonds from the commercial banking system that sells the government bonds and lowers the reserves. Then we have a money multiplier insofar as the increase in reserves is going to lead to an increase in loans, an increase in demand deposits, and multipliers that way, leading to an increase in money, both in the narrow and in a somewhat broader sense. Now, that is an open market operation. Actually, many central banks don't do exactly this. What they do instead is have central bank bills, liabilities of some time, and through repurchase or reverse repurchase operations, what you do when you issue reserves is that you buy back bills you had issued before. Same effect, reserves go up. Or you have a lending facility, where, by the way, you issue reserves was by lending, uh, lending money to the banks. Again, this makes a difference in the commercial banking system, but at the end, reserves and deposits go up. There are no CNH bonds on which to do open market operations. But there are CNH bills and there are CNH lending facilities, and this is how CNH works. Namely, the complicated way in which the PBOC does this is that there's a set of offshore clearing banks. They're the ones who issue CNH deposits. The equivalent of CNH reserves are actually in the offshore banks. The PBOC itself has no CNH reserves per se. But these banks have CNY reserves against these CNH deposits. And the PBOC does issue, the only CNH thing in the PBOC is CNH bills. Therefore, what the PBOC does is every week through auctions, goes and buys back or issues the bills issued in CNH, and by doing these auctions in CNH bills, and therefore buying them from, say, a commercial bank offshore, a Hong Kong commercial bank, achieves exactly like the same way by using the offshore clearing banks and intermediaries an expansion of the money supply. Then uh, daily, or better even hourly or minutely, the HKMA has a big stock of CNH deposits at the offshore clearing banks, and what it does with those is that it uses a lending facility to the so-called primary liquidity providers, in which it adjusts the quantity of M every minute, every hour, well, not every minute, but every hour, to try and keep the peg in line as well. And so ultimately, throughout, in spite of all the complications, it's really conventional monetary policy. So, with that in mind, understand that this is somewhat conventional or unconventional clothes of what is a conventional animal. Let me use this to test some, to understand this peg and to understand something about monetary economics. Let me start with the most important condition in all of exchange rate theories today, the UIP condition. Here applied to a bank, a Chinese bank, say, or some bank, that could either deposit in CNH, deposit onshore and earn a return on reserves, or deposit instead or hold deposit in CNH, that is the offshore amount, and it will take into account the expected change in the exchange rate between CNH and CNY. And without those files, this would be the standard UIP condition that says, note, that it's a change in interest rates that will drive exchange rates, expected appreciation, appreciation. But now imagine that money is special in that money provides some liquidity benefits, and therefore that those liquidity benefits subtract from the pecuniary return on money. If that is the case, an increase in the supply of money, M, for fixed interest rates will tend to depreciate the currency. 
there will be a monetary theory of exchange rates, there will be liquidity effects on exchange rates. Testing this has been a great challenge in monetary economics. Why? And, and what do I mean by testing this? I mean testing the idea that money is a pure financial asset, there's no such thing as a FI, the demand for money is horizontal, that if you want, UIP holds without liquidity effects as we tend to teach it. The reason why it's very hard to test this is that one, whenever changes in money supply happen, usually they come with changes in the interest rate. Indeed, that's the way, for instance, the ECB does. It sets interest rate and money adjusts. So you can't really test M independently or R. It's very hard because the foreign guys, the onshore guys in my example, they're also changing their quantity of money and interest rate. So how can you distinguish the effect of an M on the exchange rate? It's very hard because monetary policy keeps on doing things that responds in signals to markets. So expectations are going to be moving around uh, to get, as even as you're trying to do the effect of M on E. Well, for this very peculiar, but in some ways traditional, monetary world in Hong Kong and China, what we have is that, one, CNH reserves are not remunerated, so there's no change in the interest rate. Two, the PBOC's onshore policy is not driven by what's going on in Hong Kong, and so the onshore policy is not moving around. And three, the monetary policy rule is very clear. It's keeping the parity peg between these two, so I know what that rule is. So I have a chance of getting this thing, of being able to test what's the actual causal effect of money on exchange rates in a way that has turned out to be a huge challenge for monetary economists for many decades. What do I need now, though? I need some exogenous changes in M in order to see whether E moves around. And luckily, I have those changes in M. Because in 2018, when the PBOC started issuing those bills, initiated a plan to have 40 billion of three-month bills uh, and 10 million of 12-month bills, and it was heading towards it. But in August of 2019, and then later in November of 2020, because of changes to the money markets, the people in this room, but they're equivalent in Hong Kong and Shenzhen and other places, said, well, we want to change this. We're going to change the composition of how many three-month, six-month, and 12-month, as well as we need to have a little bit more than the 40 billion. We need to go up to 40 billion of these bills to then conduct the monetary operations. But because there are weekly auctions of the three months, six months, the 12 months, in not the same week, there's one week is the three and the six month, the next week is the 12 month and others, by changing the composition, what the PBOC did was to me, a researcher, do an amazing thing. It created nine completely exogenous big contractions in the money supply, or expansions in the money supply, because the three month bill would expire, it was going to be replaced by a 12 month bill one week or two weeks later. And therefore, I had two, three percent falls, uh, increases in the money supply by contractions in the bills on account of this. So I have exogenous money supply shocks, extremely rare, and I can look how does the exchange rate respond to it. Here's what it should respond in a placebo. Lo and behold, you print money, the exchange rate falls, monetarism is alive and well, printing M lowers E for a fixed interest rate. The elasticity implicit here of the exchange rate on M is 0.09, which is very reassuring because the extensive but very difficult literature trying to estimate elasticities of money demand has tended to find elasticities of money demand between 0.05 and 0.13. And so I'm finding a number consistent with a completely different literature that regresses instead broad measures of money on interbank rates and finds elasticities with different edification strategies of trying to get there. Second question, and the one that leads to, in some ways, the title of this paper, is let me go further and ask a different monetarist question, which is, how can you choose M to keep E pegged, to keep the exchange rate pegged? Why? Because money, this little M, that was the exogenous bit of the PBOC, sorry, this little M, but there's endogenous supply of money by banks who create money in the form of deposits. And how can you ever be trying to target M to E without failing uh, inevitably once you have a banking sector creating money. Now, in a model in which banks supply deposits, you're going to have an optimality condition of the type that says if the bank earns some return, let me normalize it to one in lending, then it will create deposits to equate the return on that lending to the return it pays on deposits. If it's an offshore lending and an onshore, sorry, non -shore lending and an offshore, you'll have the exchange rate. But if money matters in the sense that liquidity matters, the bank will realize that when it issues deposits, it's going to have to have money, reserves, M, in order to back possible withdrawal shocks in order to manage that M. 
There's going to be a money multiplier, M over D. You need to, if you increase D, you're going to have to hold a little more reserves. So there's going to be an extra cost, if you want, of issuing those deposits. Combining that with a demand for, of households for liquidity services, standard that the higher you pay on deposits, the more deposits the household supply, you end up with, again, perhaps a very standard conclusion, which is that if people want more CNH deposits, the CNH exchange rate should appreciate. Now, the PBC doesn't want that to happen. And so what does it have to do? It would have to increase M to reestablish parity. So the theory says, this is how you respond to shocks to the creation of money by banks. You respond by trying to print money uh, on the other side or unprint it. Let me go. Now, is that what the PBC is doing? Is that how the most success, one of the most successful pegs in history is being maintained? Let me start by noting that if it's a standard result in optical control theory that if you're trying to peg something, then you won't achieve it perfectly, but you will achieve such a deviation from the peg should be approximately bell-shaped and symmetric, which they are. This is a, the histogram of what I showed before, the deviations of that. Therefore, what happens is that when there's an increase in demand for CNH, the exchange rate is going to appreciate. The HKMA at a daily frequency is going to try to print money, lend money out, in order to bring the exchange rate down again. It's going to fail inevitably at a daily frequency. So the exchange is going to move. But if it's doing a good job, th this should be a possibly bell-shaped as it is. So what I'm going to do is say, well, I'm going to use the change in the exchange rate in a day as a measure of money demands in that day and see where the HKMA, not the PBOC, because the PBOC only acts a week later, the HKMA the next day prints the M, increases the liquidity facility in order to bring it back. There will be a test of this mechanism. Now, of course, the HKMA responds in the same day as well. And so I'll have a bias estimate, an estimate that's attenuated, because it won't have the response in the same day, only the day after. But luckily, I have a great instrument, which is that the day before, whenever the, the, CN, whenever the yuan is depreciating relative to the US dollar, because you need to go from CNY to CNH to buy dollars, you're going to, there's going to be a, a pressure for the CNH-CNY band to, to uh, emerge. Therefore, I can look at what's happening in the previous day on the control that the PBOC does on CNY dollar exchange rate, the way it tries to manage that exchange rate, as an extremely powerful instrument with an F stat of 20, 20 or 40, I forget, a big F stat, um, that um, it becomes an instrument for the day before. So I have day before what's happening in the dollar market affects what's going to happen to the CNH and I exchange rate the next day, which then I'm going to see whether the HKMA the following day is uh, doing the right thing. And the answer is absolutely. And you see that the IV is above the OLS as expected given the attenuation bias. In other words, how is this peg maintained? By managing money, old style monitors. You want to control your exchange rate. You print money when it appreciates. You unprint money when it depreciates. In this case, the HKMA. Let me dig a little deeper, though, on these five liquidity costs, desire of money. We write a model for it in which basically banks suffer random withdrawal shocks of deposits. They need to go in an interbank market. They need to go and borrow if they suffer withdrawal shock in order to be able to meet their duties or their commitments. If they can't find someone to borrow from, they have to go to the HKMA to the discount window that it has there. In that case, these liquidity costs are nothing but probability that you end up with a liquidity deficit. I got a withdrawal. If I got a withdrawal, then I either go to the interbank market, I find someone there, borrow from them at the interbank market rate, or I don't, and I have to go to the HKMA and borrow. On the other side is that I may have enough deposits. People may actually deposit in me, end up with a surplus. I, if I can find a borrower, I'll make a profit in doing that. The virtue of having this microphonation, it comes with three more predictions. It says that, look, whenever I, have these when I have, see the exchange rate uh, going up, whenever I have a positive demand shock for CNH, I should see a tightness increasing in the interbank market, which means, that it, the, which means that the interbank rate rises. But also that, if I'm holding onto my CNH and the CNH are valuable, I don't want to go buy these bills, these CNH bills. So the demand for CNH bills should go down. And moreover, if this is happening, insofar as the HKMA is responding, satisfying, doing the right thing, the demand for the discount window should go down. It's perhaps the more interesting one or the one in which the model reveals. The HKMA wants to inject more M. As it injects more M, the supply of M through discount window should go down. Because if you have more regular M, you don't need to go and get expensive M, discount window M as opposed to lending facility M. Evidence, indeed, interbank differentials go up. 
you get a negative effect on how much people show up in the bill auctions. And even though, contrast, regular money gets printed, expensive money gets less demanded, there's less use at the discount facility. Fourth and finally, now, as you know, the PBOC manages the CNY USD exchange rate. It doesn't peg it at all. It simply says, we would like to control, we would like to not have very large daily or weekly movements in this. And the way it does so is by saying we're going to have some band, the trading band, that we don't want the dollar, the CNY to move. As I already explained to you, and you can do, look at equations, but if I need to go from CNY to CNH, to dollars, and I worry a lot about the CNY US dollar exchange rate, then to the standard UIP condition now between the yuan and the dollar, I have that it matters not only the interest rate differential and whatever UIP deviations as a standard, but also if I let the CNH CNY depreciate when the CNY is supposed to be depreciating, I can offset some of that. If I let E fall below one, E tilde doesn't have to fall below one. I can use as a buffer to absorb some of the pressure, the CNH CNY exchange rate. Moreover, I can use my liquidity control over these expected liquidity costs to potentially fight, actively intervene in the dollar uh, yuan exchange rate. What that says is that if you have financial innovation, think of Goodhart's law, another classic point in monetarism, that shifts phi prime expected liquidity costs, we should see CNH CNY moving around but also that the PBOC or the HKMA or whoever's trying to control this peg can, in principle, do liquidity policies to affect another exchange rate, now an exchange rate with respect to the dollar. The theory suggests that there's, better tool, there's some tools to do this, like discount window bill auctions, so requirements. But note that if I tighten the liquidity flows between CNH and CNY, I am affecting the exchange rate with the dollar. So then, final test, and the one that doesn't have regressions because it's on recent events, but it has some pictures. 2015, remarkable things happened in Hong Kong. Some of you may know. I guess the Money Market Conference, many of you may know. Usually among macro seminars, nobody knows this. But the PBOC announced in the 11th of August 2015 that it was going to let the yuan depreciate. When it let it depreciate, what did you see exactly matching the theory I told you a slide ago? CNH depreciated in blue depreciated a lot more than CNY. A gap a relative, quite significant gap of 20 basis points emerged between the two. That gap remained. Why? Because it kept on being pressure for the yuan to depreciate relative to the dollar. The PBOC worried a lot about this. Why? Because capital controls came under pressure. There was news at Bloomberg or whatever, or FT, about what's going on in the Hong Kong market in the big time. The peg is not going to hold. What's the PBOC going to be able to do this? What did the PBOC do? Massively tighten the liquidity controls, the capital controls in being able to exchange CNH for CNY. A massive contraction in this. When it did so, it was able to close the gap. The gap started rising in. It did so a second time and again was able to close the gap, which since then has done it. All the regression I showed you before were after this period. That's when this whole builds all monetary framework really was set up. Let's look at what the theory predicts. If you massively contract the liquidity, massively tightened, I'm sorry, the liquidity constraints, the creation of money should really fall. And it did. Money supply, deposited by banks, fell by 20 to 40% during this month. This is the time in which the PBOC supposedly killed the Hong Kong market because it essentially evaporated liquidity from the Hong Kong market through these liquidity controls. Three-month interbank rates spiked massively, a gap of 6 7% between CNH and CNY. We can look at the CNH CNY comparison to understand this. And as a result, yes, so, yeah. And after that, because if you see those old reforms that I've explained to you, we start having instead a much better uh, framework to control it, such that afterwards the, the CNH starts being less volatile and much less persistent. More importantly, CNH velocity then really rises and stabilizes to a point where velocity of CNH is roughly the same as dollar velocity. CNH is a very efficient currency starting in 2017 after some of the reforms. So then, 2023 comes along. Last month, two months ago. And what happens? The yuan starts appreciating relative to the dollar. But now we have the liquidity framework that I explained to you that should effectively keep the peg. The same pressure emerges where the CNH starts trading below CNY, 
but now much less than before, 5, 10 basis points. Moreover, the interbank rate spike, much less than before by a couple of percentage points. Again, you see the type of borrowing that you would see, the printing of money by HKMA, exactly as I told you it should happen. To conclude, the framework held up exactly as I showed you in this paper. Conclusion, China has an offshore currency to enforce capital controls. That's why it has it. I hope you learned five things. How do they do capital controls? They do it, or China has two parallel currencies. It does it by control. That's the way in which it imposes capital controls. And it allows us, as monetary theorists, if you want, to see that exogenous increases in M, independently of interest rates, depreciate exchange rates, that keeping pegs about control and supply of money, that you can use now this liquidity wedge as a 4FX intervention tool, and that the liquidity framework in CNH is holding very well. CNH could grow a lot. CNH could become a much bigger currency than what it has now because all of the liquidity framework, all the money markets in CNH exist and operate well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Ricardo. Now we have Costa uh, Luis um, that is online, I guess. And uh, I will ask uh, you actually to strictly adhere with the 15 minutes allocation because we are accumulating a lot of uh, delay and I don't want to bite into the coffee break. So, Costa Luis, do you yeah. hear me? Yes. Can, can you see the slides? Not yet. We see you for now. You don't see the slides? I am saying the slides. No. Okay, let me say the slides again. Can you see the slides? Yes, now, now we see that. Yes, please. I can you see now that I move the slides? Yeah. Perfect. So thanks a lot for the, for the invitation to discuss this extremely interesting paper by Ricardo. Sorry not to be here, but today at 4 p.m. Uh, I'm moving from my apartment uh, to another one in Holland Park. So I have to be here in London. So basically, let me just summarize briefly the paper of, of Ricardo um, and Salih. So basically, there is, as Ricardo said, this is a large uh, experiment, monetary experiment, which is important both for monetary economics and, and international economics. In a sense, you have a system in which you have to reconcile an open account, an account uh, you know, which is fairly uh, free, uh, and this is the biggest exporter in the world, with a fairly close uh, capital account uh, with, uh, in a sense, with capital restrictions. You know, one, you know, the, the current account is, is giving you the yuan like to be used internationally because, you know, uh, there is a lot of exports from China to the rest of the world. But at the same time, the capital controls on the yuan makes it to be, uh, you need use it domestically, but not internationally, but you need that in order, uh, you need like a currency in a sense to transact internationally for the exports. So the Chinese answer has been to create an offshore currency, which was initially in, in Hong Kong, that's why it's the China's uh, age of Hong Kong, so the Hong Kong yuan, that circul circulates in parallel with the onshore currency, uh, the normal yuan uh, in, in mainland uh, China. Now, the, the, you know, the, the offshore one is completely free to use in payments and investments. And just to put a numbers, uh, is around 2 trillion uh, worth uh, in, of transactions per day. This is uh, in yuan, so this is around I guess uh, it's around 400 uh, or 350, you know, uh, billions of dollars per day, and it's an important part of the global of the global trade. Since you have uh, the capital controls in the yuan, in the local yuan, then you have to have some uh, restrictions on the conversion between the onshore and the offshore uh, uh, yuans and vice versa. So this is a very interesting setting. And so uh, Ricardo and Salih, they use it to, you know, to analyze this particular setting for two type of questions. One is, as Ricardo was saying at the beginning, the Chinese economy is, is the largest or is becoming the largest one uh, in the world. Uh, and so it's, in, it's very interesting by itself, uh, independently of, uh, you know, testing theories of monetary international economics. But at the same time, the particular setting which I will come back and, and Ricardo spend uh, time on that, 
allows uh, to you know test classical principles in uh, monetary international economics that link money to exchange rate and in that setting is uh, the internal validity is so good that you can go and just draw lessons outside uh, China. So the results are, are, you know, four type of results. The first one is that these exogenous unanticipated, uh, you know, uh, Ricardo, remember the picture that Ricardo put, those exogenous anticipated change in money, they are uh, affecting the exchange rate. The elasticity is relatively small, but, you know, but it's, it's, it's the monetary principle that there is, if there is more money, then the, last, the, the FX should depreciate. The second thing is how do you sustain these two, these two currencies, like uh, what Ricardo was talking about, the Greg's hand law. And it's just whenever there is a scarcity of, for instance, on the, just to put an example, on the Hong Kong uh, yuan, on the, off, uh, on the offshore yuan, then uh, there will be an elastic supply of money, for instance, from the HKMA uh, on, the following, on the following days. Another thing, uh, and I will enter more in, into these last two points uh, later in the discussion, is that many times in, in some countries, like potentially in right nowadays in the Euro area, in the United States, when there is a scarcity of a particular money, like meaning pu public money, then the private market will have an incentive, right? If there is a scarcity and the FX is changing, maybe you want to accommodate private money so that, uh, you, you know, you get the, in a sense, you arbitrage that scarcity, and then you would lose, you would lose the, say, public money and the exchange rate uh, correlation or, or causality, in a sense. And so the way the Chinese, uh, you know, manage this is not only they have capital controls, but they have liquidity controls that complement the capital controls. And in that, in that sense, it can be successful to, to have these two parallel systems. And then, uh, since the U.S. dollar has been prominent, uh, you know, even back in 2006 and 2005, and you have has been even in the 90s has been very prominent for the for the Chinese. Uh, so they manage the you know they, they care about the effects with the U.S. dollar. They use the deviations of the onshore offshore yuan in order to manage the 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 you know the effects between the yuan and the dollar. So this will be the. Basically, the results, the contribution, and the setting. The general comments, uh, I, I must say that this is an extremely important paper regarding the question, regarding the settings and the, res and the results. I never say this, and you should read the paper. I mean, I, you know, like it's a paper in which I like, you know, there is a moment that they write, uh, Ricardo and Salid, they write, if you are satisfied with this, just go to the next session and skip this. Um, details on monetary operations, but the monetary policy, the, the institutional details on money markets and monetary policy are extremely interesting for China and, and in general, not just the economics on the four results. And given that this conference is about money markets, I, you know, I encourage you to read the paper, all the parts of the paper. Now, uh, as I said, you know, as, as, as they say, and, and, and you know, since China is becoming very interesting, you, you can, you know, analyze and understand better this biggest, uh, largest economy in the world. But the second thing is that it's extremely good for identification purposes, which is very important because sometimes, uh, you know, literature is plagued uh, with identification problems. And so the typical identification problems are, is that money reacts to economic activity and to exchange rates, so it's endogenous. So here, uh, they got these bills, changing bills uh, in particular moments in time. They are small shocks. Uh, then many times exchange rate is a price, so they might be a reverse causality to previous money. There are many omitted variables, like macro variables might be, uh, or macro variables might be uh, affecting both exchange rates and uh, money. And then the endogenous monetary policy reacts and monetary policy rates, interest rates, not only money plays an important role. So the key thing is that this institutional setting, including the Chinese monetary policy tackling more local issues and the different instruments, they allow uh, the identification. So since these are my general comments, which are, are, are very positive. I want to say a couple of four uh, slides uh, on, on some things, maybe 
potentially to improve uh, the paper. Like, and I do this a lot on internal validity, and I also always have the issue of external validity, so this is applies to my research. But, you know, I, there is a tension between internal and external validity in the sense that, you know, this is a setting which is very good for identification, but it's a setting in which there is the capital controls, there is the liquidity controls, key private players are, uh, are, ch are subsidiaries of Chinese state-owned banks, then both the, I don't know whether the HKMA, uh, but, you know, banks and, and Hong Kong is heavily influenced by China and Chinese policies. So, you know, you have two systems, you have two systems uh, with, uh, uh, you know, two systems with, uh, you know, in the sense that one might control uh, kind of, of both. And an important point that I wanted to make is that, and, and here I want to ask more uh, uh, Ricardo, and maybe they could expand a bit more in the paper, that, you know, it seems that there are not so many close substitutes to, you know, offshore uh, yuan, such as, for instance, uh, given that this conference is about money market, like, for instance, repos. Repos would be like, for instance, in 2006, uh, 2005, would be private liquid safe assets with similar maturity to money. So they are very close to substitutes to money. And that part, part of the paper is about deposits, bank deposits, but they have some limitations on that. So in a sense, if there is a scarcity of money in the United States or Europe, class substitutes can jump in. But maybe in, in, in Hong Kong, there are not all these potentially substitutes in the sense that there are the, 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 the type of assets are limited. Plus, there is the restrictions on, 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 liquidity, on liquidity management. Now, a, a, a question in a sense is not so much a question, but something that they could improve is so there has these two parts china is very important you are analyzing this very nice and at the same time you have four very general results for a monetary economics and international economics do you put the same emphasis on both is it one more important than the other and to me what it will be very nice in addition to highlight the chinese you know is to highlight the chinese particular setting as a unique place for identification but it's not so much affecting the external validity on the results. And I think that you can improve on this and be more persuasive on this. Just let me just put you an example. For instance, in many, in many, when you don't have high hyperinflation and you have relatively low inflation, there is no relation in empirical studies between money and FX. And a question, uh, you know, is it just because uh, you know, the literature, the empirical literature is plagued with, you know, with identification problems, like, uh, you know, the ones that I was telling you before, endogeneity, omitted variables, uh, reverse causality, or, you know, or, and is it the case that in some settings it's much easier and is much, is much less regulated to expand the private money or private safe assets, which are very liquid, and therefore these, they break the relationship between money and FX. So what of the two, uh, what of the two uh, uh, are the answers, or are both? And in order, so my suggestions could be whether you could exploit a bit more. So one way to explore it is whether there are time varying regulations, like for instance, on the 2016th uh, shocks, or other ones in the creation of private money at the time of scarcity of the onshore yuan. Another way is the offshore centers are in Hong Kong, and, and the H means, H means from Hong Kong, but there are now other ones like London, uh, Singapore, Luxembourg. So maybe in these places, in some periods, it's much easier to provide uh, private money in case of scarcity of public money. And whenever there are deviations on FX, you can arbitrage them. And if there is a scarcity, you can provide that scarcity. And this might be easier in some uh, um, offshore centers than others, and on other uh, times. With this, you could, you know, in a sense, shock the kind of kind of liquidity regulation and the kind of, also depending on the offshore center, and then tackle this question whether is it just purely that you have a better identification setting or is just more related to the, to the substitutes of, of money. The final uh, three slides, uh, so, I mean, I, I found these uh, explanations institutional this uh, very interesting. So on the Chinese central bank, and also uh, these are, if I understand correctly, these are Chinese state-owned bank subsidiaries of, uh, for the offshore. 
they do more on the liability things, either more long-term, like bills, or more short-term, like research deposits. So a question that I have is whether they also directly, in, so the, the directly intervene, the, the, you know, the, the, the Central Bank of China directly intervene in the FX market, and in particular the, the um, Chinese, the Yuan, the onshore uh, Yuan. And why I'm saying this, uh, because potentially they could do it, not only the SKMA can do it, like here, you know, lending, for instance, to primary liquidity providers or putting deposits, but potentially the, the Reserve Bank of uh, China. Why I'm saying this, for instance, in Fitch, this is a particular morning time, but in Fitch, you know, they, they, there is this uh, article in Fitch in which they said that when, you know, the, the onshore uh, renminbi you know, the, the onshore yuan, when, you know, it, you know, there was a lot of scarcity. And they say in this case that the, you know, the, you know, the, the popular, the People Bank uh, of China uh, Central Bank uh, bought on, offshore renminbi, that is CNH. Is it the case? Is it not the case? Is it the case on a string, uh, on what I have it, on a string operations? On extreme circumstances, maybe they don't have it. Maybe these things that Ricardo say are in normal times, but maybe in in, in very significant times, the, the central bank of China directly intervenes in this market, uh, or just they only intervene through bills. Through bills, they can intervene in two ways. You know, you adjust these bills over time, or maybe another question that I have to Ricardo. Uh, you know, for institutional details, is whether they can call back existing bills and so draw, draw down uh, liquidity from the market. Okay, and then there is also that they care about the US dollar and they intervene through the through the onshore Hong Kong, and, and Ricardo also tackled that in the last question. And then here, a question which is, could it be that because the exports and the dollar is so important for the Central Bank of China, in addition to intervening like in here intervening in, in some strict circumstances, whether you know the, the, the monetary policy also pays uh, attention to because it pays attention to the Chinese GDP and to the effects and the you know off, offshore Hong Kong could be uh, the, uh, the offshore yuan can be important. They do it. Uh, they also pay attention to the to the exchange rate between the two, between the onshore and the offshore. The last slide. I think I, I am on time. You know, it's a paper that I. I, 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 I wanted to read more. It's 58 pages, but you, you, you stay there and you want to read more. I don't know whether you felt the same with Ricardo's presentation, that you want to, to know more. And so things that they don't have is like other related experiences. For instance, one experience that is completely different here, there is no peg currency, but in a sense, the euro area dollar market is an example that, you know, for different regulations between the US and outside the US, they created a different uh, dollar market also related to taxes and many other things. There has been many pay currencies in the past in which they have liberalized current account, but not capital, current account, but not capital account, like for instance, Europe before the 1990s. Nowadays in the Euro area, we have a stream version of, of pay currencies in which uh, you know, we have one Euro. There is no capital controls, but whenever there were problems, for instance, in Cyprus, um, there were capital restrictions, uh, capital controls in, in the crisis of, of Cyprus. Things to know more about the, the money markets uh, is what are the closed substitutes, Not all, and before I was saying more the repos, but also the closed substitutes in the sales of safe assets. It doesn't need to be with short maturity, which will be more like a substitute of money, but with different maturity. So it, it looks to me reading that there are very, very few substitutes, and therefore it's much more difficult Apart from the liquidity regulation, it's much more difficult for the market to provide substitutes. But now that there is London, Luxembourg, and all these places, I wonder whether those places uh, are, are jumping in, in when, when there are scarcities of, of the onshore, uh, of the offshore, sorry, yuan. Final thing I want to say is that uh, there are currency boards uh, in which normally there was very strong currency like the dollar and a weak one like the Argentina peso, and they were not max as success. But the Chinese case is different. And, you know, one of the few cases in which has been very successful is the Hong Kong doing the currency board. And that is also the HKMA. So is there a kind of fixed effect 
and not fixed effect econometrically, but a fixed effect that whenever the HKMA is there, you know, they manage very well a peg either with the dollar for the Hong Kong dollar or with the onshore uh, yuan. And thanks a lot. Uh, it has been an extremely great pleasure. And I hopefully these comments are useful. Uh, for, thank, for you. thank you, thank you. So maybe thank you. Uh, I'll give the floor to Ricardo for the action, and then unfortunately we have to cut on the general question. I'll ask you all to uh, reach out to Ricardo in the coffee break because otherwise we'll not have time for the coffee break. So, okay. but you have no. all the time. I'll Five very short answers to Jose Luis or follow-ups. First of all, I agree with 97% of what you said. Uh, and so thank you very much for all the comments, mostly because, um, um, uh, as you said, we're kind of also been fascinated by this. And you are, some of the points in your last bullet are papers that we're trying to write right now, just other papers, not in this paper. And others are papers that we should be writing that I didn't think of. And so those are the ones that I would do. Uh, but five very short points. And the first one, on the um, um, offshore centers. I agree entirely. I would love to write a paper that used the London, Singapore, Hong Kong. Um, a lot of the effort in this paper, which we've been working on for more than a year, was just getting the data, understanding how this works. I mean, like I said, institutional details is just part of China that they don't explain to you actually what they do. And it takes a lot of work just to figure out exactly what they do. And so I'm happy that you liked section two. It was a lot of work doing section two. I hope other people will like it, just explaining and understanding what they do. It did require, though, then, and the reason why we were able to do it, Salim and I are not particular China experts, was because Hong Kong has an HKMA, which is a phenomenal institution, and a BIS office, which is a phenomenal institution. And so we could really learn a lot and get a lot of really high quality data and so on. So now we just need to put that effort for Singapore and London and others, but that's just why, uh, why we do so much of that. Number two, the Fitch description that you said, in some ways, in some things, it fits essentially what I was telling you earlier, really. When they said, they were a little imprecise, so they say like, oh, they bought CNH. The PBC doesn't hold any CNH. What they did was exactly let the bills expire. When they said, and you noted, Jose Luis, so little imprecisions, they don't buy back the bills. But because the bills come due and they have it rolled over so that every two weeks there's an auction for the three month or every week for when the maturities, they simply can just go and issue fewer or less. So they never buy them back. But again, at a weekly frequency, they can perfectly control it that way. So that sentence was imprecisely written now that I understand this better, that, that paragraph from Fitch. But it fits exactly into what was explained earlier. And that is what they do. They absolutely intervene in that market. And why they intervene in 2016? precisely to control the M, to close that gap, and as they were using it as escape valve to the dollar. So, so that, we could spend 10 minutes just on that paragraph, but basically you can map it into all of the things that I had said earlier. Just, I hope, progress, scientific progress, now we understand more precisely what all of those intervening kind of sentences meant. Third, briefly, repos, absolutely. I mean, I think the yuan has grown a lot. Um, it is becoming a normal currency in that sense. But one of the issues that it has is that it's still bonds issued in yuan in which you could repo are still scarce. Why? Because you have these short central bank bills and you do not have a big government, China, issuing CNH government bonds to spur a, gov a repo market such as the one in the previous paper. And with that limitation. Now, what has been going on, including very interesting recent paper by Schrager, Majori, and Clayton and others is exactly about in the last two years, three years, China's starting to grow a bond market uh, that's trade internationally. Ultimately, CNH bonds de facto, even if pegged in some ways. And that is the next stage. So in a sense, the Chinese uh, are on it, meaning they're trying to precisely create that sense. But as of now, it is a less uh, liquid, let's say, or I think you put less alternatives than, than you would have for the dollar, mostly because you're missing the repo and the bond zone. I will defend myself on external validity because you know, we just saw an amazingly good paper that was very about what happens in Europe. And it was about internal validity and nobody complained about external validity then. <laughs> China's a big economy, it's just like the Euro area. But I guess you got away because we're in Europe, but, uh, which is fine, we're at the ECB in some ways. Uh, fourth and very clearly, HKMA fixed effect, absolutely. Again, what I use a lot, remember that bell shape, is the fact that HKMA has done an amazing job helping control this exchange rate. Turns out the HKMA is an amazing institution because they've been pegging the HKMA dollar to the US dollar and they do an amazing job at it. And here they are managing another peg of CNH to CNY at daily frequency. And again, they do an amazing job. So it's absolutely an institutional fixed effect. Since we're an institution, one to copy. We should spend more time learning what THKMA and how good of a job they are. And then finally, I'll just finish with the Euro dollar market. And so that I will say, Jose Luis, 
that we're totally on board. We've had an idea before you did three months ago, which is we want to write a paper on the euro dollar market. Because once you understand what's going on here, what strikes you is there's a literature on the euro dollar market in the 1970s and how it emerged. Uh, it's different, but shares many similarities, and that's what we're working on right now. Not for this paper, but because it's interesting enough, even including institutions, that it's going to take a whole new paper. But that, you've guessed exactly what's taking most of my time these days. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot to all the participants, Davide, Stefan, Jose Luis. Good luck with uh, the location and, uh, and Ricardo. So uh, let's have uh, Stackley again at the, the coffee back, but let's uh, congratulate the speaker.